Assalamu alaikum everyone, welcome back to a new video. In this video we will talk about a new organism. It's not a pure coccus nor bacillus, it's a mixture of both. Please welcome Bordetella pertussis, our gram-negative coccobacillus guest of the day. Although it will be a short, concise video, we will cover the most important details that are related to Bordetella pertussis. We will talk about its characteristics, important lab features, clinical importance, including its toxins, and then we will end with treatment and prevention. Now for the features of Bordetella pertussis. As we said, it has a cocobacillus shape. Remember the symbol, a red board, which resembles Bordetella pertussis, and it's red because it's gram-negative. It's aerobic, which means it can survive in the presence of oxygen. It's also catalase positive, which breaks down hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. It's encapsulated, and lastly, it has filamentous hemagglutinin, pertactin, and fimbria, all of which help Bordetella pertussis in attaching to the respiratory epithelium, which enhances its virulence. Now in the lab, there are certain media which help in growing Bordetella pertussis. These are Borde Gengao agar, which contains potato extract, and Regan Lui medium, which contains charcoal, blood, and an antibiotic. These are nice to know info, but are not really important for medical students in board examinations. Another way to identify Bordetella pertussis in the lab can be by using PCR, which is short for polymerase chain reaction, which can detect the DNA of the bacteria. Another way is serology, which basically means we're looking at the antibody that is generated by our immune system in response to a Bordetella pertussis infection, or by using direct fluorescent antibody testing. In addition to the previous features, pertussis has various toxins that add to its virulence, which includes pertussis toxin. This toxin inactivates G-alpha I protein, leading to an increase in cyclic AMP formation. Pertussis toxin helps in evading phagocytosis. It can also negatively impact chemokine receptors in lymphocytes. These receptors are responsible for helping lymphocytes in locating the infection in order to fight it. Pertussis toxin is sometimes referred to as lymphocytosis promoting factor, since it prevents lymphocytes from locating the infection and leaving the bloodstream, which can lead to lymphocytosis. This is important and frequently tested. Although it's a bacteria, it's characterized by lymphocytosis, and now you know why. It's nice to know that the degree of lymphocytosis somewhat correlates with the severity of illness. Second toxin is adenylate cyclase toxin. From its name, it functions as an adenylate cyclase enzyme, which ultimately also leads to an increase in cyclic AMP. This toxin can affect the immune system from mounting an effective response by disturbing phagocytosis as well as reactive oxygen species production by neutrophils. It's considered among the important factors in whooping cough disease along with pertussis toxin. And lastly, tracheal cytotoxin. Since it's a cytotoxin, it affects the function of cilia and ciliated respiratory epithelium. Now for the clinical importance. Bordetella pertussis is transmitted through respiratory droplets, which happens during coughing or sneezing. It can also be transmitted directly when a person comes in contact with infected respiratory secretions. Bordetella pertussis is famous for pertussis, also known as whooping cough, or the 100-day cough. This disease mainly affects the respiratory system and is characterized by three phases. The first phase is the catarrhal phase, which lasts for one to two weeks. Patient during this period can have fever, runny nose, and mild coughing. Patients are also highly contagious during this phase. The second phase is the longest and most serious, which is also known as the paroxysmal phase. From its name, it's sudden, uncontrollable episodes of severe coughing. In between the cuffs, patients can have inspiratory whoop. Also, patient can have post vomiting, which simply means vomiting after coughing. In some cases, patients can also have subconjunctival hemorrhage or rib fractures, although it's not very common. Infants usually have more severe problems, such as cyanosis or apnea. This phase usually lasts for 2 to 8 weeks, but can last longer. And lastly, the last phase is convalescent, which is simply the recovery phase. Bordetella pertussis treatment is easy to remember. It's a macrolide. Do you remember this red board? 
Now look at this. It's a red Mac board. Red board for Bordetella pertussis and Mac for macrolide. However, if a patient is allergic to macrolides, we can use trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. For prevention, luckily we have a vaccine. It's an acellular vaccine, which means it's only a subunit of the organism. And it's known as DTAP or TDAP. D for diphtheria, T for tetanus, and AP for acellular pertussis. Post-exposure prophylaxis is recommended for all close contacts to a patient with pertussis using a macrolide regardless of vaccination status. This means, even if the close contacts have already and recently taken DTaP, a macrolide is still recommended after being in close contact with a confirmed pertussis case. Alright, to sum up, today we talked about this red MAC board. Bordetella pertussis is a gram-negative cocobacillus, aerobic, and encapsulated. With Bordetella pertussis, remember the number three. Three structures which help in attachment, Three toxins, pertussis, adenylate cyclase, and tracheal cytotoxin, and has three phases of clinical disease, cataral, paroxysmal, and convalescent. And finally, for treatment, we use macrolide, and for prevention, we use DTAP. And by this, we conclude this video. We hope you found Bordetella pertussis fun, or at least the name of it. And until next time, don't forget to like and subscribe to receive our latest explanations. And as always, thanks for watching.